will be going through today my 2024 Power and Confident Poetry predictions and full essay plans that you can use if any of these come up. Okay, let's run through what has been examined first so we know what's come up and then I'll give you my predictions. In 2017, it was The Effects of War and the poem was Bayonet Charge. In 2018, it was Power and the poem was Ozymandias. In 2019, it was People Are Affected by War and the poem was War Photographer. In 2020, it was how people are affected by difficult experiences and it was Remains. In 2021, it was Control and the poem was London. And in 2022, it was Conflict and the poem was Bayonet Charge again. In 2023, it was Power and the poem was My Last Duchess. So I've got two different predictions as to what I think it could be. And I'll also give you essay plans for both of them. So the first one that I'm thinking that has not been examined at all is nature, particularly the power of nature. We have seen nothing come up about the power of nature. So I think if nature is examined, the poem that they will give you is exposure. It could be Storm on the Island because that hasn't been examined, but I'm thinking exposure because it'll probably be able to link to more. You can link it to conflict. You can link it to power. You can link it to war. So I think exposure. So if exposure does come up, I'm gonna give you a comparison table, so like a little essay structure that you can put in to compare it. Now, I would actually compare it with Ozymandias. Now, you could compare it to, you know, The Prelude, Storm on the Island, other ones to do with nature. I would compare it with Ozymandias because it links really nicely with the power of nature versus the power of humans. And I think a lot of you would find it a lot easier to write about Ozymandias. Guys, if you do want the poetry structure comparisons, if you want comparison tables, analysis, key quotes, context, form, structure for all the poems, it's on the Light Up Hub, already done for you. We've got practice papers, grade nine essays for you also to reference. And we've also got it for unseen poetry as well. So make sure you check out thelightuphub.com or have a look at the description below and I'll put a free lesson for Power and Conflict Poetry for you all. So I'm gonna break it into similarities and differences. So the first similarity, both show the weakness and fragility of human power compared to nature. So what I mean by that, fragility means something that's easily broken and both poems basically emphasize the fragility of human nature and use it as a point of comparison with the power of nature. Nature is indestructible, it is eternal, it continues on regardless of human power. And we see that shown through both poems. So the point you could give in Ozymandias, Ozymandias shows that tyrannical power is inferior to the power of nature and sands of time. So Ozymandias, remember tyrannical means a cruel and oppressive leader. So what Shelley is doing here is illustrating that the sands of time or the power of nature will be eternal yet that juxtaposes the fleeting nature of tyrannical power. So being a tyrant, being a cruel and oppressive leader will not be long lasting. So a quote that you could use to show that is the lone and level sands stretch far away. Now that's the last line in the poem. So that really exemplifies the power of nature. It's the final thing to finish the poem. So it shows that the final thing that will last is nature, not tyrannical power. Okay, so the point you can make for exposure is, exposure shows that even human power of war and corruption is nothing compared to nature. So of course, exposure literally exposes, as shown through the title, the idea that human power, even down to the corrupt human power of war and the belligerence of war, is nothing compared to the power of nature. We see the personification of nature throughout, how it is this barbaric force that actually the real battle is not between the men and the other men in battle, so against the other human power, it is against nature. The real battle Owen exposes is the battle against nature and particularly, of course, the power of nature. So a quote that we could use to support that, Dawn massing in the east, her melancholy army. Now this reinforces the point of the power of nature through the personification. Dawn is the coming of a new day. The fact that she's massing in the east, her melancholy army, shows that with every new day, the weather is this belligerent, almost human-like force. It is defeating the men. This barbaric force is indestructible. And now let's look at a difference. Exposure shows nature to be a belligerent force, whereas in Ozymandias, it is more an eternal power. So the difference in the power is that in exposure, like I said, it's more of a belligerent force. It's more this forceful, barbaric force 
that is battling against the men. Whereas in Ozymandias, so the power of nature is more used as a comparison of this eternal power and how it and how it continues on, it's long lasting, which of course compares with the fleeting power of humans. So in exposure, you could say, in exposure, the men are emasculated. So emasculated is using their masculinity against them, making them feel weak, using their masculinity. Whilst also physically and mentally exposed by the power of nature. So we can link it here that it's more down to the men's emasculation. They're made to feel lesser than men. Think about it. These men have gone to war. They're expecting to fight this belligerent war against these other soldiers and be killed and this savagery. Yeah, they are rotting away in the trenches and they are like being killed by the weather. Think of how emasculating that would be as a soldier. As a soldier, they're expe expecting to fight, yet the real fight is a battle they are constantly losing, and that is just something of the weather. Something that continues on, it's always there, but that is what is slowly killing them. They are slowly rotting in their trenches because of the weather. So emasculation is a really nice idea to link to exposure. And the quote that could support that, pale flakes with fingering stealth come feeling for our faces. So this is the idea that even the pale flakes, these small minuscule flakes of snow are what is tormenting them. They're in this agonizing pain just from the simplicity of snowflakes. Therefore, again, it reinforcing that emasculation and linking to the power of nature and the power of nature is more of a belligerent force in comparison to Ozymandias, which is more of an eternal force. So now if we're linking it to Ozymandias, we can say Ozymandias, it is used more as a comparison with the fleeting power of human power. It isn't a destructive force. So unlike to exposure, it's not this destructive force. It's more to reinforce the eternal power of nature as a juxtaposition with the fleeting human power. That is the main point of comparison. So the evidence that we could use to support this, nothing beside remains, and then compare it to stand in the desert. So thinking about how this statue of Ozymandias is broken, it's shattered, and how that compares, it's in this desert. This desert is ongoing. It's been there for forever. Whereas in comparison, Ozymandias' statue has been there for a fleeting amount of time, and it is broken because of course he doesn't have this respect and his human power is not long lasting, which juxtaposes with these low level sands, with the desert that has been there forever. Okay, my second prediction that it could potentially be is I think it could be something to do with the conflict around identity. Now, identity hasn't been examined, but I definitely think that it could come up, linking it to like the identity of the individual, the conflict about an individual's identity, anything like that could really work. So I think the poem they would give you would be checking out me history. Now, cause that links directly to identity. There's a lot you could say about it. I think it's quite an accessible poem that a lot of students, maybe you don't like it, but you could probably analyze it and understand it. So what I would actually recommend to compare it with London. Now London as a poem, you can link it to identity, the oppression of identity in the Victorian London, and I think it would make a nice comparison. So let's go for a similarity first, and we'll give our evidence and our points. Similarity. Both explore the oppression of identity through higher authoritarian powers. So both explore how an individual's identity is oppressed, so like reduced down because of these authoritarian powers. So these higher powers, these people in positions of power. So let's go for our point for Checking Out Me History. Checking Out Me History illustrates how he was metaphorically blinded to his own identity through the omission of black history by the authorities of education. So omission, it just means like it, they got rid of it. So we can link it more in an educational sense in terms of the authoritarian power and how it blinded him to his own identity. He was unable to understand and develop his full sense of identity because he was given this Eurocentric version of history. Eurocentric, like European version of white history and black history was omitted. So it was not shown, it was gotten rid of. So therefore part of his identity couldn't develop because he didn't understand everything about his culture and his past. So the quote that we could use to support that, Dem tell me what Dem want to tell me. So linking this idea that his, the history he was given was of course biased, that he was only told what they wanted him to know, which of course restricted him from fully developing his identity and therefore 
it was oppressive. The Eurocentric history was oppressive to his identity. Now let's compare it with London, looking at the similarity between oppression and identity. London is scathing of the oppressive mind control the authorities suppress the citizens of London with. So linking it to London, of course, linking it to Victorian London, very restrictive, very oppressive, particularly of the individual. There was no sense of identity. They were forced to conform to societal ideas. And we see that through these mind control that Blake showcases through the poem. So the quote that we can use to support that, the mind forged manacles I hear. Think about manacles is chained, mind forged, and how they were mentally controlled, their identities were oppressed by the authoritarian government. They weren't allowed this individualism. They were completely restricted and hopeless. Now let's look at some differences for identity. Agard focuses on the emancipation from this oppression of his identity through knowledge, whereas the bleak tone in London suggests no such freedom. So we get this real sense of hope and hopelessness in both poems linking to identity. We have this very hopeful presentation through Agard. He discovers his identity, he understands it. He begins to become unblinded from the Eurocentric oppression of his identity. However, we get no such hopeful tone in London. It ends very bleakly and both poems, we can compare the end of the poems and what that actually showcases about identity. So let's look at London. London shows the relentless oppressive cycle. Every child born is another victim to the paternalistic society. Paternalistic is just freedom restricted. Really, really nice word to describe. So it's this very bleak tone. It's hopeless. There's a lot of despair that every new child is born will be subject to this oppression. They will not have their own identity. They will have no sense of individualism. There will just be another cog in the machine of oppression. So a good quote to support this, blast the newborn infant's tear. And again, that's towards the end of the poem. So it really reinforces this bleak time. There is no hope. There is no escaping this oppression. There is no sense of developing an individual identity in London. Really, really bleak. And now let's compare that with the end of the poem with Agard and how that links to his identity. So in Check Out Me History, Agard's emancipation through discovering his own identity is salient through the final line. So we can see the sense of mass emancipation, freedom. He is freed from the oppression and the restrictive ideas placed upon his identity by the Eurocentric history. Through this knowledge that he discovers about black history, he's able to free himself from the shackles of this oppression. And let's look at the final line in the whole poem. He says, I carving out me identity. So the idea that he is personally doing that shows the sense that he's got this power. He has now become empowered through learning about his own identity. So there's this real hopeful time that you can free yourself from the oppression given by these authoritarian states of power. And we see that through the final line encapsulating that he is able to take charge of his own identity and he is no longer oppressed. So they are my 2024 predictions, either something about power of nature or the conflict within identity. Of course, these are only predictions, guys, but you can still use the comparison tables and the things that we went through in this video. If you did like it, make sure you subscribe to the channel because it helps the channel more than you can know. Share this with a friend, help them out as well because we're all about help, helping everyone on this channel. And of course, if you do want this in a lot more detail, do check out the Light Up Hub because it has everything and a lot more detail that I, that I go into on this channel. I'll see you on the next video, guys. Bye.